All right. Uh, welcome today to our uh, high rounds. Um, we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Miley Karras, uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Owen Clinic, uh, to talk to us today about uh, one of the updates uh, on CROI 2023. Uh, so this is one of several uh, updates that we're, uh, we'll be giving uh, this month. Uh, and so she's going to be uh, focusing on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, just a brief background, which I uh, pulled off the internet, uh, which is always true. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Young is a board certified infectious disease uh, physician who specializes in caring for individuals with HIV. Uh, she's part of the Owen Clinic, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, she completed her fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSD and a residency uh, in internal medicine at Oregon Health Science uh, University in Portland, Oregon. She earned her medical degree from University of uh, Hawaii at Manoa, John A. Burns School of Medicine in Honolulu. Uh, she's board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. Um, and uh, she's one of my uh, favorite colleagues here at UCSD. And uh, she's gonna talk to us about antiretroviral therapy. So. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Dan. You must have a lot of favorite colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but no, same, same. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, was asked uh, and, and volunteered to do this talk. Um, and uh, I'm not a pharmacist. So I may actually, if anyone asks me a question that I can't answer, I may actually ask some of my pharmacist colleagues who are hopefully on the call to, to kind of step in. Um, so disclosures, in the past 12 months, I have gotten funding from both Gilead Sciences and Vive Healthcare. Um, these are both completed and they were funding to the institution for research. But I do want you to note that um, given that I am going to provide some general takeaways from some of these studies. And of course, you know, it's always good to know in what context um, I am making these, these, these comments. So we'll first talk about newer antiretroviral therapy. Um, and I think most folks, I believe, are aware of lenacapavir. It is a, a first-in-class small molecule HIV-1 capsid protein inhibitor, um, and it's impactful at several stages of the HIV life cycle. It's also incredibly potent. And because of that, uh, lenacapavir is actually being marketed as, uh, or approved now um, for use as an injection subcutaneously every six months. So it is currently approved, I think, in, in US, Canada, and Europe only for the use in uh, people living with HIV who have multi-drug resistance. So that is currently its indication. Um, and I, I am gonna talk about lenacapavir in, in a couple of different settings, and, and hopefully this can inform all of us as we try to figure out how do we use this new tool in, in, in our armamentarium uh, to better improve the care of the people that we care for. So the first study is the Calibrate study. This is a phase two open label um, active controlled study to, to really support the future development of future lenacapavir containing regimens. And this study uh, is looking at treatment naive persons, so not exactly what it's currently approved for, that are initiating antiretroviral therapy um, with either lenacapavir combined with FTAF um, or uh, oral uh, BFTAF. So there's four arms in the study and it's randomized 2221 because we all know that BFTAF works very well. So they didn't have to have uh, the same number in, in that arm. The first arm is lenacapavir subcutaneous with oral FTAF for uh, 28 weeks or, or six months-ish. Um, and then followed by dual therapy with lenacapavir and oral TAF only. The second arm is similar, except, except after the first 28 weeks, um, it's not with oral TAF, it's with oral bictegavir. Uh, um, the third arm is oral lenacapavir and oral FTAF kind of throughout the entirety. And then the final arm again is Bictarvi, that's the, the competitor arm. Um, so it's important to note that in, in the persons that are the dual arms, so arm one and arm two, Everybody had to have an HIV viral load of less than 50 copies at both week 16 and week 22 in order to continue to dual therapy. If they did not, then they were not continued in that arm. So some baseline characteristics of the study. Overall, uh, you know, these are naive persons. So maybe it's not so surprising that the, the median age is fairly young in the 20s and 30s. Although I am happy to see that they did include older adults. It didn't seem to be 
exclusive. Um, the oldest adult that that is recorded here is 72 years old. Um, the they didn't re recruit as many women um, or at least female sex at birth that I would have liked to have seen, but there are some in the study. Um, they did a better job at enrolling uh, people who are black or Hispanic. Uh, and, and as you can see, you know, these are naive. So their viral loads are fairly high. Although there was a, sorry, let me just close that off. A smaller percentage of persons. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, a smaller percentage of persons that were, uh, had a, a very high viral load. So really only any 10 to 20% of people had a viral load of 100,000 copies. So there wasn't a, a big representation of that population. And again, you know, these are naives and, and we are starting people right away. So the CD4 T cells were actually fairly high. And when you look at, at the efficacy snapshot, you know, over time, at week 28, everything looks, looks great, uh, really across the board. At week 54, it goes down a little bit. Um, and then the percentage of participants that have an HIV RNA less than 50 copies at week 80 is, is still a little bit less. So over time, it seems like there's less and less people uh, or percentages of, of participants that are able to have an HIV viral load of less than 50 copies. But it's not the whole picture. So if you look here at week 80, you know, like uh, some of the arms look like they're not performing as well. But if you go and actually look at some of the details, um, most of, of, of the, the missing here is not because of significant differences in the proportion of people that are viremic. It's really for other reasons. So we're seeing here that people are falling out of arms, not because you know, their, their viral load is too high or they have a blip or something like that, but really for other reasons. So in, in a couple of, of the, the arms, it more disproportionately there are participants that wanted to stop doing it. So in arm two and three, um, you know, four participants decided to, to withdraw. Arm three, five participants decided to withdraw. Um, there were a couple of investigator decisions where they withdrew people for, you know, that whatever reason that investigator was doing it. And then there are a couple of lost to follow-ups, as is very true for our clinical care as well. So overall, this regimen in uh, people who are, are naive looked pretty good. And I think that that can be proven or at least better demonstrated by uh, looking at the changes in CD4 T cell counts and uh, participants that have an HIV viral of less than 50 copies. So really across all four arms, regardless of you know, whether or not you switch to FTAF and had dual therapy with that, or to BF or uh, BICTARV, or if you're on oral uh, lenocapavir and FTAF or, or BFTAF, um, they all kind of look the same. So these regimens, at least now out to 80 weeks, look to be pretty similar to each other, essentially equivalent. Now, there were three people that did develop drug resistance in this study, and all of them were in a lenocapavir arm. Um, here you can see the emergence of lenocapavir resistance in, in both arm one, two, and three. Uh, only three. So the, the participant in, in arm three was the only person that uh, seemed to, to have uh, the reason behind their, uh, their emergent resistance was uh, non-adherence related to pill counts um, and drug levels. So why the persons in arm one and arm two develop resistance, I think is, is still unknown and under investigation, at least unknown to the public. Um, there were adverse events, and if you look at the comparison between the total or the, all of the persons that were getting lenocapavir um, versus, oops, sorry, versus those that were uh, uh, still on BF-TAF, there was a little bit more nausea in this population, which I, I find interesting. I wasn't really expecting that. Um, and they had more influenza. Again, you know, we don't really understand why. Uh, there seemed to be more persons in, in this uh, group that had influenza. But again, you know, it's 157 persons versus 25. So this is, is this just, be, I mean, it's percentage, but is this just because there was a greater proportion of people that maybe were exposed or, or not in, in different ways is, is unclear. Um, and I appreciate, oh, sorry, I don't know why this is here. I appreciate that. Uh, they also included weight change. So when they looked at weight change from baseline, um, again, you can see over time that all of the arms looked to be about the same. 
um, in, including with the BMI change. So they, they looked pretty much the same. No matter what you're doing, everybody gained a little bit of weight. One might argue that in the arm that was switched from FTAF to Bictarvi, which is this arm two here, maybe there's a bit more of a stabling out versus ongoing increase in weight. I think it will be really interesting to see, you know, as the study is taken out further, um, if indeed it seems that there's no further weight gain in this arm of, of uh, linocapavir and Bictarvi compared to the other arms that contain uh, TAF. So, this is my takeaway, and I'm sorry that it came out weird. Um, but why I thought this study was important is I think it, I think, um, you know, I really think that Lena Capivir for treatment naive is exciting. Um, I think we still need to have a better understanding of what is contributing to failure in persons uh, that are on these regimens, um, i.e., the development of Lena Capivir resistance. Um, I'm skeptical about a strategy of combining a long-acting injectable and pills. Um, and I'm skeptical mostly because when we tried to do, uh, in my end of one patient where we tried to give that person both um, long-acting cabinuva or long-acting cabotegravir repivirine and oral medications at the same time, um, they were unable to take the oral. So I, I'm not sure if this specific strategy will be sustainable in the long run, um, but maybe there'll be other strategies coming down the line. So maybe we'll have a linocapavir injectable um, and, and an implant or something of that sort. I don't know, but but overall, I thought this is really exciting. I think it's promising and um, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, we have some, some novel innovations going forward. Um, I'd love to hear what people think about this. Do people think that folks will take a long acting plus pills? So with that segue, um, Miley, there was a, a question, and maybe people can kind of ponder oh. about that. But there was a question about did they did they show from Nettie, did they show why for the people who dropped out? Or, um, yeah, I guess why people dropped out in the Lena Capivir arm. Uh, so she was wondering if it was nausea, and nausea is a pretty intolerable side effect. Uh, I don't I don't know. Um, so I'm sure that data exists. It, I didn't see it presented. Um, but, uh, but stay tuned because I'm sure that we will be seeing that data moving forward for sure. And, and okay. Nettie, I, I agree with you, this combo of, of injectables and pills, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. uh, Robert said, uh, so in terms of the nausea, do you know how long that be just given it, it's a long acting agent? So that's one of the concerns is if it's, you know, in the system for a while and causing nausea, that, that can be, you know, an issue. I think that that's also a great question that wasn't elucidated in, in this uh, specific poster, but but all things to be keeping out for as we get more and more information about lenacapavir. If I could <laughs> just uh, add, I'm sorry. Yes, please. No, I was just gonna say, if I could just add about the nausea, just from our brief clinical experience, we have seven patients on Len. Um, um, we've had a few say they felt nauseous with the oral lead-in, um, which is just a two-day oral lead-in, and no one's um, really had nausea related to the injection. So I don't know if maybe that's what this was tied to, you know, the nausea in this study was when they took the oral LEN pills, but I'm not sure. That's helpful. Anybody else starting LEN yet? That have any any other thoughts? Well, uh, Gigi wrote here, she is a patient with MDR, HIV, and LEN and cap, cabotegravir is saving his life. Um, and then Aaron just had a comment about, uh, I think some will be adherent to pills, but uh, many may have poor adherence uh, to pills. Wonder about a salvage regimen of an uh, quote unquote extra agent on board to cover for poor adherence. Yeah, no, I agree that the, the dual therapy sounds great in the context of a clinical trial. Um, but I agree, Aaron, it does make me nervous. <laughs> To not have a little bit of backup there, um, but you know, thank you for leading me to my next discussion about lenacabavir in heavily treatment experienced people living with HIV. Um, so this is um, a, a study that you know contributed to the FDA actually approving lenacabavir for highly tre heavily treatment experienced persons. Um, uh, the Capella study, you know, looked at people who are really resistant. So you, in order to enter the study, you had to be by remic. You had to have um, documented resistance to at least two agents, maybe more, 
And you had to have less or equal to two fully active agents um, from the main ARV classes to be included. Um, so some people who, most people who met that criteria were randomized, but there was a screening period where they kind of evaluated people over time um, for a brief period to see if there was a natural decline in their HIV RNA on their current regimen. Um, many people ended up falling out of the randomization uh, because of that, because they actually either were taking their meds a little better or, I don't know, looking at two, two periods in time, you know, maybe had a blip and then things got a little better. And they were actually put into another arm that was kind of an open label, non-randomized cohort of oral and a capavir followed by injectable and capavir. So this functional monotherapy study has already been completed. And essentially what it found is that persons that were um, on oral LEN compared to just placebo and a failing regimen, 88% um, of people who, who got onto LEN within that 14-day period of time had a greater than half log decline in their HIV viral load to 17% on the placebo. So it, this is pretty effective, although I think all of us recognize and realize that we would never want to put somebody on one active agent unless somebody really was dying. Um, so what I'm really going to talk about today is the maintenance phase and the data from that. So this, you know, I think unexpectedly this, or expectedly, the age median was a little bit higher here um, because they needed people that were high, heavily treatment experienced. Unfortunately, that's often um, many of our folks that were diagnosed in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, there were much more women, which, you know, or at least female sex at birth, which uh, I uh, am happy to see. Um, and they, they did a, a, a pretty decent job as well at recruiting um, uh, persons who are of the black race or Hispanic ethnicity. Again, you know, the, not a lot of people had a super high viral load um, as expected with uh, heavily or highly treatment experienced persons or uh, low CD, CD4 T cells. But what was particularly interesting to me was um, the number of participants that enrolled that technically had no fully active agents in their optimized background regimen. So 17% of this cohort um, apparently had no optimized background regimen or no fully active agents. So they did change uh, some of the optimized background regimen as people were coming in. And, and you can see that based on the percentages of, of persons in this failing regimen here that, that had no fully active one fully active or, or you know, greater than two or greater. Um, thankfully, with the OBR, they were able to decrease the percentage of persons that had no fully active arts down, um, while uh, in, as well as uh, uh, increasing, I guess, um, the percentage of, of people who uh, had two or more um, uh, uh, active agents in their optimized background regimen. So this does not include lenacapavir. Um, this is, is just other medications and their optimized background. So I wanted to point this out because the data that I'm going to show you, um, we have to consider that it's not just the lenocapavir, um, that there were changes in the regimen, and some of these changes may have contributed to what we see. So week two efficacy um, was about 78% overall. And I really like that they tried to break this down into different populations. They looked at differences by age, persons that are 50 and above or, or younger. Um, they looked at sex at birth, at race, um, particularly black race uh, and region that people were in. Um, and really they didn't find any differences. So all of those factors did not make any difference in how people responded to lenacapavir plus optimized background regimen. Um, similarly, they looked to see, you know, does your entry T cell count or HIV viral load make a difference in response? That too was non-significant differences. So coming in with a low T cell or a higher T cell didn't make a difference. Coming in with a low or a higher viral load didn't make a difference. All these people did about the same. Um, they looked at, you know, was it less efficacious or not based on NC resistance, and that didn't make a difference. There was no difference whether or not you were using dolotegravir or darunavir at baseline, um, and there was no difference of the use of ibilizumab or fostemsevir. So this background history um, of baseline use really didn't seem to impact how people responded to lenacapavir plus OBR. Um, and this is the slide that shocked me. Um, 
even if you had no fully active agents in your OBR, um, that also did not impact your response to, to lenacapavir plus this new OBR that they were giving persons. And for me, how I kind of interpret this and love to hear what other people say, um, I think it really speaks to, you know, the, the benefit of having uh, antiretroviral therapy pressure on HIV, even in the context of what should be HIV that's very resistant. Um, and then adding, you know, a, a lenacapavir or another uh, new antiretroviral on top of that may be sufficient to um, ensure or enable uh, persons of with HIV to, to then become virologically suppressed. And now this is only out to 52 weeks. You know, I think I'm, I'd love to see this further and, and I hope that we don't see, you know, any differences further out, but, but I do think we still need a little bit longer data. So my takeaway here is that in, in highly treatment experience or heavily treatment experienced persons with multi-art resistance, lenacapavir provides more options. But, you know, I, I think that it's the implementation of lenacapavir that unfortunately may result in some delays. Um, thoughts, comments? Uh, chat's been kind of quiet on this okay. one so far, so. Okay. Okay, Dr. Karras, then I'm, yes. I'm going to take this moment to have Pam Reyes just say a few words, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Pamela Reyes. I'm with the CME office here at UCSD. Um, I'm sure Marvin has been sending out a lot of emails letting you know that we have gone officially live with the Cloud CME system. I actually see uh, at least about 15 of you have texted in attendance this morning, so thank you for your participation. I'm really here just to say that we're really excited to be launching into Cloud CME. It incorporates all our CME activities, including attendance, um, evaluations, transcripts, disclosures in one system now. So hopefully that will make it for everyone as they are speakers, filling out disclosures, and as well as learners and attendees having to um, text in attendance and grab their own transcripts for their own needs. Um, I'm here for tech support. If you guys need anything or if I can answer any questions about the current system, please feel free to ask. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go awesome. on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <Is it> okay? <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I guess people can chat if they have any questions with the Cloud CME. So, so of the lenacapavir studies, this was actually the one that was I was most excited to see. Um, in this study, the team combined three long-acting agents. One uh, was terapevimab or TAB, a monoclonal antibody against the CD4 binding site of, of GP120, and zin, zinlirivimab or ZAB, um, which binds the VT loop of the HIV envelope. Both of these monoclonal antibodies were modified to extend their half-life out to like 60 to 80 days, allowing it to be dosed in a Q6 month type way. Um, and about 50% of persons with plague B are thought to be sensitive to both of these antibodies. 90% of persons are sensitive to at least one of them. Um, and uh, they paired this with lenacapavir and hypothesized that this combination would enable the delivery of antiretroviral therapy um, every 26 weeks for people who are suppressed with HIV. So um, again, uh, they, they basically, this was a randomized study. Um, it's persons that were suppressed. They had to actually have a pretty high CD4 nadir 350 and a CD4 at entry greater than 500. So this was kind of biasing towards healthier people living with HIV. Um, they randomize it into two different groups, both who got lenacapavir, both who got TAB at the same dose, but ZAB was dosed at, at two different uh, doses. And originally the study was supposed to go out to 52 weeks, but there is a delay in startup related to uh, lenacapavir having some storage biocompatibility issues. So they had to amend it and, and stop the study, unfortunately at 26 weeks. I'm um, going to kind of skip some of this stuff. I'll skip some of this stuff too. I mean, I, the only thing I'm really going to point out here is that, the, you know, I, again, I wish they had a little bit more women and diversity, but, you know, this is a very, very small study, only 21 participants. So efficacy outcomes at week 26 by FDA snapshot. Um, essentially what happened here is uh, only one person in, in the, the lower dosing of ZAB um, had HIV variamia of, of greater than 50 copies and one person withdrew. So in both arms, you know, like there was one failure, virologic rebound, um, and one person just left. Um, that person that did have a, a increased HIV RNA was placed back on their baseline oral suppressant uh, or oral meds and immediately suppressed. 
So in general, these medications appear to be fairly safe and tolerable. Um, uh, lenacavivir, again, is a subcutaneous injection. So as you can see, most of the complaints or the side effects were related to injections. There were a couple of grade threes. One person had a cellulitis related to the injection, and the other person just had a very um, extreme injection site erythema that resolved on its own. The, antibiotic, the cellulitis resolved with antibiotics. And there was one um, grade one infusion related uh, reaction because the, the monoclonal antibodies are given by infusion. Um, and that was some pyrexia with flushing that just resolved without any therapy. So at least in this small group of people, it seemed to be fairly tolerable. Uh, here's a PK of the monoclonal antibodies here on the left. And as you can see, the confidence interval is very, very tight with these monoclonal antibodies. And all of them are way above what's deemed to be the, the efficacy uh, concentration cutoff rate. Len has a confidence in in interval that's broader, that's kind of known, but still consistently above um, the, the dose, the target dose that they were going for, or the target levels they were going for. So the one person that did have viral rebound, um, they did look like they were sensitive to both uh, monoclonal antibodies. They did not have pre-existing LEN resistance mutation. Um, and uh, they couldn't, when they tried to repeat resistance testing of the rebound sample, the assay failed. So we don't know, you know, like, was this just a blip? Um, was this a failure? Um, I think we, we still don't have a lot of idea about what happened to this one person. Um, and if you look at what, what, what that person's PK was, you know, they had great PK of their monoclonal antibodies and their lenacapavir levels are actually higher than what would be expected of the mean. Um, so it's still unclear why that person had a rebound. So the takeaway and why I was excited about this study is, is I, I really do believe that every six month therapy for HIV will become a reality. And I think seeing a study like this uh, gives me a little bit more hope, um, but we do need more data. <laughs> you know, we, have, we need to have a more diverse population. We need to have more numbers. We need to follow this for a longer duration to see if this specific strategy is feasible um, and could work for a, a broader group of people. Um, and we and cost-effective um, to be giving people to monoclonal antibodies and lenacapavir. Um, are we gonna be able to actually do this if this proves to be a, a, a good strategy for folks? Okay, I don't see anybody putting anything, saying anything else. Nope. Okay. Um, so the next newer antiretroviral therapy that I'm going to talk about is Islachivir. I mean, I think that most people are really interested in these two. Um, so Islachivir was originally in development for HIV treatment and prevention. Unfortunately, um, you know, this is another first in class, very potent antiretroviral therapy. Um, in December of 2021, they paused development because many of their studies, or actually all of their studies, were demonstrating reduced lymphocyte counts. Um, in persons who are on a slash of air, including their PrEP studies, so including people who were not living with HIV. Um, they've since identified that the mechanism is that uh, a slash of air triphosphate preferentially accumulates in lymphocytes and at super therapeutic levels can contribute or result in apoptosis of lymphocytes. Because of this work, um, the slash of air 60 milligrams per month for PrEP uh, is, is discontinued. So they're no longer moving forward at looking at uh, long acting oral prep, unfortunately, um, but reasonably. They still are moving forward though with the development of a for HIV therapy. And they're looking at two specific regimens. One is a combination of deravirine and Islachivir um, with a very low dose of Islachivir daily. And the other a higher dose, um, plus lenacapavir, 300 milligrams oral per week. Um, and, and this study, this basically uh, poster was going over the data of the lymphocytes. So I'll just briefly kind of run you through this data so folks that are not aware can, can, can get up to speed. Um, it seems to be that the impact
uh, combined with a another um, and as we we see that the higher doses of, of both these NRTTIs um, does actually contribute to more decreases in lymphocytes. But at lower doses, 0.75, and again, this is higher than what they're currently moving forward with um, with the oral. There were there were still some decreases in lymphocytes, albeit much less worrisome. Um, here, I think just wanted to show both of these slides to show that when people were on the 60 milligrams of PrEP in both women and men, there were pretty steep decreases in their lymphocytes within three months. But once the, the uh, Islachia was discontinued, the lymphocytes recovered um, all the way back to normal, although it took a year. And this was the case for both men and women. With men, they, men recovered their lymphocytes in 11 months, women in 12. Um, similarly, with people living with HIV, uh, we saw, again, you know, on treatment, there, again, this is weeks versus months, so 24 weeks, six months. Um, we saw steep decreases, but when stopped, they came back up. And, and this brownish uh, uh, line here is, is uh, BF-TAP. So in comparison to BF-TAP, for example. Um, so even in people living with HIV, who we might think might have a difficult time recovering their lymphocytes, um, they still were able to recover back to normal once the higher doses of Isatravir were discontinued. Um, this dose of Isatravir, again, this is not what's moving forward. This point, oops, sorry, this 0.75 dose uh, was also interesting. So it, it decreased, albeit not nearly as bad as the higher doses. So really, this is a dose effect again. But around um, study week 48, it started to taper off. So it, it's, it, I think the, this study is important because it demonstrates that, um, yes, decreases happen, but it doesn't continue over time, at least with these lower doses. There seems to just be a tapering off and a persistence at a, a lower percentage, although not ongoing loss. Um, and so this is one of the dose finding studies that they, they did, I think, to try to figure out whether or not they could move forward with, with a slash of ear. And, and here we see that at the current dose that they're using um, combined with Derevering daily 0.25, really there's no difference at all from Derevering 3GC and TDF. So at this dose of 0.25, it seems pretty safe. We see no difference in, or any evidence of decreased lymphocytes. Um, similarly, the higher doses 0.75 and 2.25 um, are not nearly as bad as they were uh, with the, the other doses, but we still see that they do start tapering off um, and over time do contribute to lower lymphocytes. Um, here's the CD4 T cell counts for those of you that are like, I don't care about lymphocytes, I wanna, I wanna know about the T cell count. Um, so, you know, because we're treating HIV in this context, the CD4 T cell counts did increase. Um, and the Estativer group had no evidence of, of uh, decreased uh, CD4 T cell counts. Over time, they continue to increase. Um, here, the higher doses uh, kind of tapered off. And, and the thought might be, as you think about the slide before, is that as the total lymphocyte count goes down, there's, all many, there's only so many T cells that can, can uh, come back after being treated for HIV. So all of these, uh, I think, doses are currently being evaluated. I could not find any, any data around um, lymphocytes or CD4 T cell counts with a slash of dose weekly at that two milligram dose, which is what they are moving forward with. But I think that in the future, it will be really interesting to see, does it look more like this small dose here, 0.25, that's daily, or is it looking more like the, the higher doses that are given daily? Um, but that is, is yet to come. So takeaway, you know, I think more work needs to be done um, here. We possibly will have another two drug regimen that we can use. Um, and I don't know what I'm gonna do with that yet. Um, so, you know, we've got now several two drug regimens, probably more on the way. Um, it's always nice to have another option. Um, you know, we have a couple of, of our patients that for whatever reason, they just can't tolerate a whole bunch of different classes of medications or, or drugs. And maybe having another two drug regimen would be helpful um, for, for folks like that. Um, I do think it would be helpful, though, for us to at some point have a two drug that's weekly and oral. I think that having that option for a lot of people who don't want to get a shot every two months or every six months um, would be a, another wonderful option for our folks. Okay, so um, 
moving into long acting injectables. I'm wondering if I should skip some of this stuff. I have a, a lot to talk about. And I know that we only, we end at 845. Um, so I'm gonna briefly go through a couple of, of uh, long acting capitegravir repivirine studies. Um, we basically, are, I think most of us are really familiar with this medication already. Um, in the original studies, the ATLAS and ATLAS-2 uh, demonstrated that dosing every eight weeks was not inferior to dosing every four weeks. However, um, when you look at week 152 data, it does seem to start to separate. So all that far out, um, there are slightly higher detectable, higher rates of detectable HIV in people in the Q8 arm, 2.7% versus 1% versus a Q4 arm. And virologic failure is also slightly higher, 2.3 versus 0.4. So um, I think that that's important to know. Um, and this group wanted, this group is uh, in France and they really wanted to explore, you know, like what factors contribute to that. So we do know that some risk factors for virologic failure already is the development or the pre-existence of ropivirine resistance mutations, a BMI that's greater than 30, um, persons that have subtype A1A6 and uh, low repivirine troughs in, in eight week dosing. So they evaluated in two hospitals, um, people who are switching, again, you know, suppressed, um, stable, uh, from oral antiretroviral to long acting cavitagra and repivirine and just followed them over time. Um, I'm gonna skip this a little bit. You know, the, I, I, this, is, this is fairly representative of the population that France has, you know, younger, um, mostly male and, and MSM. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out, though, is that they had a pretty low oral lead-in with their cabopivirine. Only about 28% of the people in the study had an oral lead-in, which just keep that in your mind when I show you the next slide, the next study. Um, so they uh, followed them for a medium of about eight months. You know, they had about four participants that had a viral blip. Um, but really only one that developed virologic failure. And, and this person was 30, they had a BMI of 29. Um, they were uh, previously virologically suppressed. They did not get an oral lead-in. They were found to have um, suboptimal, uh, both cabotegravir and ropivirine trop levels. So when they looked to see what factors were associated with um, lower cabotegravir and ropivirine trough levels, um, at least for cabotegravir, you can see very clearly the differences between whether or not someone had a lead-in versus not lead-in. So here, um, you know, cabotegravir thresholds in the first quartile is about 1120, so you'd like to see them at least that or above. Um, ropivirine is 32. Ropivirine seemed to do pretty good. You know, we don't really see problems here with their trough levels, but cabotegravir was where um, some of the issue was. Um, and, and there's clearly a difference between whether or not uh, their participants had an oral lead-in. Um, and again, you know, when they, they kind of analyze this further, they did identify that a BMI of, uh, a higher BMI was contributory to the trap level at month one of cabotegravir, but not later. Um, but lead-in really at, at both time points significantly contributed to the trap levels. So, you know, their conclusion and mine um, is that we really shouldn't be considering an oral lead-in in all persons pursuing Q8 week dosing. I think having a conversation with them about how, you know, this will likely allow them to be more sustained on this regimen over time and not fail would be, well, hopefully would be sufficient to encourage them to pursue that. And I really think we need to have it in persons who have a BMI of, of 30 plus. Um, they also wondered, you know, is, is this going to play out in PrEP? You know, will we see similar findings in PrEP? And, and I think that that is, that's a great question and, and yet to be answered. Um, and I'm following that up with uh, a study from our pharmacists, and I really wanted to highlight their excellent work and just briefly talk about um, what they did. So they looked at our, um, uh, our experience of 144 persons who were switching to long-acting cabotegravir pivorine. Um, they had a, million, a median follow-up of 20, 278 days, so you know, quite some period of time, um, and looked to see, you know, was there any relationship between their pre-viral load trends and whether or not people blipped, had persistent low viremia or high viral load, which was defined as greater than 200 copies per mil or continually suppressed. Um, and interestingly, we had a lot of blips. So after the switch, about 60% of, of folks that switched maintained a viral load less than 20. 
82% um, had a viral less than 50, um, and then most people, 97%, had a viral less than 200. Four, pers four persons had a viral load increases greater than 200 after the switch, and three of them resuppressed without any intervention, and unfortunately, one person developed virologic failure. Um, in further multivariable analyses, they identified that having persistent low-level vi viremia pre-switch was associated with having at least one viral load greater than 20 post-switch. Um, so whether that means, you know, that that person just has CD4 T cells that are waking up and, and producing virus, and, and that's kind of what they're going to do, or if there were some adherence issues, which really shouldn't be an issue post. Um, I think for me, when I see that, I, I really do think that these post switch viremias are more likely just, you know, CD4 is waking up and producing some virus. Um, we did not see any difference with a higher BMI um, or injections outside of the dosing window, although to be fair, most persons that had to have an injection outside of the dosing window were either covered with uh, an oral bridge or just were one day late. Um, so their takeaway is despite frequent blips, there was only one virologic failure in this fairly large population of people living with HIV that were switching. Um, I will say that one thing that, oops, in the previous slide, or one, one very big thing that was different between the previous study and, and the study that was done here um, was that uh, most of our, our patients at the Owen Clinic completed an oral lead in. So over 84, 85% of our patients did do that. And I think that might be one of the reasons why there were some of these differences. Um, so when you're going to ask me to give the R talk, I inevitably will try to switch it to, to squeeze in some other non-anorentrovar related studies. So this is all one of them. Um, so I actually found this to be a really interesting study. It was a study of three big centers, UCSF, UAB, um, and I can't remember the last one, uh, Chicago, I believe. And they evaluated people in their clinic uh, to, to identify like what types of a program um, to provide long acting non-retroviral therapy would you prefer? So essentially this was a discrete choice experiment. And not surprisingly, um, a lot of the participants said that of course they would not wanna have to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> um, if they had to be something, less was more. Um, interestingly to me, they preferred getting this medication at their HIV clinic. You know, a pharmacy separate from the clinic or a place where they stayed or a mobile clinic was viewed as far less favorable than their HIV clinic. They liked the idea of being able to potentially have an extra visit with their doctor if they needed it. Um, they wanted a short visit. They liked 15 minutes better than longer visits. And they also wanted to have um, availability of extra support services like case management and social work and would love have loved for this to be available with extended hours, so weekends and after hours. Um, for me, I feel like I, I loved this study. I, I think nothing was particularly surprising except for um, the importance of the HIV clinic, that people wanted to come to the HIV clinic to do this. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that that this might inform some really cool and innovative programs moving forward. Maybe even some uh, cost effectiveness studies that demonstrate the value of having extra support services and extended hours and the potential revenue of enhancing the long actable injectables to health systems. But, but anyway, so that's that. Um, I have more, but I, I'm, we're at 845, so I'm gonna stop. Um, I'm happy to talk about switch studies. I had a couple of studies here on comorbidities, but but I think I'll stop now and, and take questions. All right, thank you. Um, so I think uh, there are, I think there are a lot of uh, discussions we can have, and I think uh, Nettie just uh, brought up a, a question about how people are pairing uh, provider visits with apertude or Cabinuva injection visits. Um, and I, I guess we can open it up just to see how uh, what people are doing or if they want to answer that question. Go ahead and unmute if you'd like to. So Aaron says there are typically C patients every other injection and then PRN. Um, I don't know if Lucas, if you're on, if you want to. Uh, yeah. Um... <clears throat> Uh, we don't, I don't know if we, we don't necessarily have like a set 
like protocol for pairing provider visits with injection visits. Um, I mean, it's something we've talked about that what we've noticed for some patients is they're consistently showing up for their injections, but not their visits with their provider, which could be a problem. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to kind of address that with um, like, you know, when they come in for their injections that the nurses are scheduling provider visits and things like that. But um, but I think every patient too is a little bit different in terms of how frequently they were already following up with their providers. If it's, you know, every three months, every six months, even less. So um, we don't have really a set interval. Darcy, did you want to say something? You had shown your camera. Okay. <laughs> Any comments, Smiley, or? No, I mean, I think, um, I mean, you guys know me. I would love if we had extended hours, more support services. <laughs> um, I think, and you also know that my, my struggle is always like, how do we actually communicate that that's valuable to people who pay the bills? Um, apart from, you know, like bringing in grant money, which apparently we're also having difficulty getting the institution to acknowledge. Um, but um, I, I mean, I think, I think it's it's important to uh, the reason I like that study is as we are thinking about innovative approaches to to further combating social disparities of health and access to long acting injectables. Um, these are things that we need to think about, you know, we need to we need to listen to our community and and they're telling us what they want from us and us having this great idea without like I think running it past community first. Um, is probably a recipe for disaster. So, so my big thing with all that is like, let's let's keep talking to our community and seeing what they want. So speaking of the community, uh, Jeff Taylor says extending injections <laughs> to six months intervals will be a game changer. Uh, I don't know, Jeff, if you wanted to, to expound on that a little bit more or? Um, sure, I mean, I'm a, I switched to Cabanuva and and doing the shots is, is scheduling them can be a real problem. I had to change uh, insurances and that's been a god awful nightmare. So I think if you can pair it with your, um, because most people are in six month uh, provider visits, right? And that would be uh, much easier for patients and for clinics to schedule. But, you know, the other issue is, at least where I get it done, it's not my provider who gives, gives the shot, it's a nurse, it's a separate thing. So, you know, it's still another level of coordination if we're all one person doing it in one visit, but that's not at least how our clinic does it, where I, where I get mine. Yeah, and it looks like Adam uh, Bortner from Family Health Center says that the uh, visits for CAB or CAB repovering are usually a provider visit, so mm. uh, they're they're doing it that way. And uh, I'm sure every uh, clinic will have to figure out the, their own strategy. Um, I think Darcy wrote here uh, was anything at on at Croy and self administer CAB repovering, uh, and, and Miley said no. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, uh, Robert Dice, uh, the long acting agents are also, uh, always potential game changers for resource limited settings, uh, access, access, access. And Anything if anybody else? wants my slides that I have just a couple more slides on some of the switch studies, and then a couple slides on, um, comorbidities, uh, specifically weight gain and depression, I'm happy to just disseminate that it's, it's all public anyway, because it's, it's crying. So, um, just send me an email and I'm happy to send it. All right. Uh, Jeff says, I am uh, self-injections as an option will also help. So I think uh, that idea is great. Um, Miley, just FYI, I will be presenting some data on the uh, metabolic stuff. So okay. uh, uh, so you can send me your slides okay. and I will present them in a few weeks. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, thoughts, comments? Uh, before we end, uh, so Nettie here says, I worry about self-injection since Lucas mentioned at resistance rounds, a patient who had the med uh, leak out from the injection site. I worry about the feasibility of it because um, it's currently a moneymaker, right? So I <laughs> I think some institutions might be giving up some revenue if they you know, release the meds. It's not a moneymaker. I thought it was a moneymaker for us. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh. Uh to be continued, I suppose. Okay. Um, there was a there was a poster about thigh injections. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if the I don't know if the intention is for self administered thigh injections, but um, I think it may be more gluteal fatigue that they're looking at for an alternative yeah. site. But um, but there was that. Yeah. Basically, it just showed that thigh is as good as gluteal. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. 
Since Thank we you. have Lucas oh, in yeah. four minutes, sorry, I, I had a question that we, we looped over, but I was going to harass Lucas about it by email, but um, <laughs> I'm very interested in this idea of the oral lead-in as a loading dose. That's not really how it was marketed to us. It was marketed as a tolerability trial, not a loading. So uh, that's not how I've been thinking about it. So that's kind of shifting my thinking. And then it's like, well, if it's a loading dose, how much is needed? Is two weeks enough or whatever? And all of us have people who, you know, a patient is on a meprazole, he's going to be off his meprazole for two weeks doing his loading dose. So I said, okay, we'll compromise. We'll just do it for two weeks. And, you know, I have another patient who got a rash on the loading dose. So I'm glad we did it. So, I mean, it has its function, but I hadn't thought about it as loading. I thought about it as tolerability. So I don't know if Lucas, we can put you on the spot and, and have you comment on that. I, I'm unsure about the results of that study and the correlation with loading dose um, because uh, I, first of all, that was it was a relatively small number of patients, so I think we have to be careful about you know that being an artifact. But I, I, um, you know, the the peak there's PK data that shows that there's no difference in drug concentrations. I believe it's one month after the initial injection, whether someone gets a loading dose or or a, or a lead in or not. Um, now. Uh, the, the, I think the data from this poster was looking at three-month concentrations. Um, I have a, a hard time understanding necessarily why the three-month concentrations would be different, whether they did a one-month or a lead-in before, before starting it. Um, but I believe the data from Vive around the PK of with or without a loading dose was based off of the Q monthly injections. But again, um, the, the first injection uh, dose is the same whether they're doing Q1 or Q2 months. So I'm not so sure about that. And then, you know, in our study, yes, 80% did have the loading, the oral lead-in, but that's because um, we needed follow-up time. And all the people in our cohort that included in that study were people who started early on CAB um, before the oral lead-in became optional. Um, and so, you know, we have now 95% of people that are not doing an oral lead-in um, and going right to injection. You know, I, I, we haven't, you know, we've had, you know, really only um, one failure um, of a patient who kind of um, didn't have another reason for failure and kind of fit the, the ideal population who would be getting, um, getting you know, cabropiverine. So I, I'm not so sure um, about does doing an oral lead-in really um, increase risk of failure. Yeah. I would be more inclined to believe BMI is a, a, a stronger predictor. And I think BMI is more likely to affect drug concentrations than um, doing an oral lead-in, but that's just my take. Well, I want to just comment, Nettie, on that study is that they they were they were assuming, right, that when they were finding these lower do the uh, trough doses, um, that that would contribute to failure, right? Just because of what's been looked at before, but they only had one failure in this cohort of 58 people. Um, so I'm going to so go back to thinking about it as a tolerability trial <laughs> until Lucas says, think of it as a, as a loading dose, because that had not come to my mind and that kind of really shifted yeah. my thinking. So, okay, I'm going to go back to how we were. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess, you know, if you think about it, if you, if you give a shot, shouldn't the level be probably super therapeutic very quickly and then slowly drop. So, so from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, I mean, I, I wouldn't understand why the levels would be low enough to then be at risk for um, failure. So, um, Do you but, know anything about metabolism and, and how does metabolism change over time based on turning, you know, enzymes on or off? I don't know. Actually, I have no idea what cabinet though. So. Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. No, I don't, don't think it's expected to, to change over time. Both drugs do go through the typical SIP metabolism, but, um, but yeah, not, not anything over time. Okay. Uh, well, great. Uh, thanks. I see Marvin showed up, so we must be ready to end. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was just staying, I'm staying on if people have, ha are having trouble with the new system. Okay. Great. Well, let, uh, go ahead and close in. Uh, certainly want to thank Dr. Uh, Karras for uh, a provocative talk about uh, what's new out there. And uh, uh, as a reminder, uh, please uh, go ahead and text your uh, attendance for CME credit. Uh, the code was 438, I believe. 
Yes. And um, uh, hopefully we'll see you the rest of this month. Uh, we do have uh, more uh, updates. Uh, do you have, uh, Marvin, do you have the next uh, next week's? Yeah, talk? next week is going to be um, Dr. Riggs doing a neuro HIV. Uh, the following week will be Dr. Little doing one on HIV um, testing and prevention. And the last one is Dr. Lee. <laughs> good. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good weekend.